Hi, Dan Ayers with NGH, here to hopefully take a little bit of mystery out of the upcoming installations for A2L products. We've asked Jerome Smith, one of our senior tech advisors, to come in and help take some of the mystery out of an A2L installation. Jerome, thanks for joining us today. No problem, how's it going? Going well. So, uh, you know, at tech service, you guys get a lot of these questions. You're on the forefront of what the, our installers are feeling. So Correct. Um, hopefully you can kind of walk me through some of these changes and, and let the audience know why we did some of these things. So uh, here we have one of our new coils. This is a C75 coil. That's our right. new nomenclature. And uh, there's a few changes that really jump out to me. The first one, I see a lot of different labeling. What's all that right. about? These are labels that, are, that you will find for anything that is now going to be 454B. Um, just to let you know about the flammability and the risk. You also find here another uh, label that tells you where to make connections in, in the event that you need to make one outside of the coil cabinet. Yeah, I see the 10 feet, and that's a big number that we've had. I know Aaron on the last Lunch and Learn talked about that quite extensively. Right. Uh, I guess if you make a braze connection outside the cabinet, we're advising that that be at least 10 feet away from the ignition source. A minimum source. 10 feet away, correct. Great. So uh, along those same lines, I guess up as part of that, our RDS, or our refrigerant detection system, um, is located inside the cabinet. So if we can make our braze connections inside, that's gonna help minimize some of that hazard. Is that accurate? Correct, that's accurate. Okay. Yes. So I know the biggest thing that would say, normally those would stub out from the outside. I, I, we have one of the old ones here. So this is a picture of our C74. Right. Uh, and normally those line connections, you know, your cabinet would be a few inches in here. Correct. Right, but we changed that. That way everything's inside and our RDS can handle that, that uh, leak should it happen. But, you know, how would you get your, your line set through the old door, which was be two piece? We made some sheet metal changes here, right? Yeah, as you see, we now have a three piece door. Um, makes it easier to get the line set in. And when you make that connection, it's easy to put it back together. Gotcha. So now you can put the door around the line connection. Around line connection. Rather than have to, you know, Correct. pull the door off and chase it somewhere up. Correct. Okay. So it looks like we talked about the labeling, the stub out. I know our big electrical connection. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but what do you say we pull these doors off? Take a look inside. That sounds good. Just give me a second, go grab some PPE and I'll be right back. All right, I'll grab the drill. Sounds good. Okay. So now that we've got the doors off, you can see, you know, first thing, it looks like a coil pretty much like we're used to. Uh, obviously the sensor here is kind of the big one, right? Correct. So when that comes in, I know we're going to have this coiled up with uh, some restraints on it. We cut those off just for the sake of the, right. uh, of the presentation. But, um, you know, here where you're going to have to make those connections, now we're naturally kind of brazing a little bit closer to the coil. So right. uh, what does our audience need to know about brazing the new connection points? Well, one thing you need to know is that, um, like I say, due to it being inside the coil cabinet, you always kind of want to have a heat shield. Uh, for the purpose of this video, we've kind of got the heat shield already installed, and that's to help. Uh, protect the coil from the heat so we don't damage the coil and, you know, and we can prevent any future leaks from happening. So kind of best practice for technicians doing these installs to carry something like that. Some something kind of like heat shield or yeah, some kind of protect a, that coil. Correct. So we want to protect the coil. What about our metering device here? Uh, yeah, we also want to protect this. Um, it's the piston. Um, me, I kind of like to grab a wet rag. And that's going to be true. I know we have a piston here, but should it be a TXV? Same principle, right? Same principle. Correct. Yeah. That metering device want to make sure that as we're putting heat to the unit, nothing transfers down there. Correct. And we still get a good meter uh, yep. on the refrigerant coming in. You just kind of want to wrap that to help the heat transfer so we don't put too much heat around that, that piston there. Now, I know there are some products out there, um, heat wrap, some, some different chemicals. Uh, do you feel those work any better than, than just a wet rag? Uh, I guess it just depends on what you like. You know, I mean, I personally prefer like a wet rag. Um, some people may prefer it. Um, they, they make putties and whatnot, but yeah, I mean, good old wet rag is do it every time. So, so just install a preference, just like it's always been, as long as you got a good protection on your metering device, we should be in good shape. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then I see we have our, uh, connections up here. Now our liquid line has that, uh, Schrader valve. So I'm guessing we're going to want to take that out. Do we have to cut it off? No, we'll want to take that straight valve off and behind the straight valve, you can sweat that off and there's a swedge point to connect your 3 copper. Oh, great. So there's no cutting there. And then I see we have our, our sleeve there on the, the vapor line too. We'll right. to take that off, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll have to take that off um, so we can have access to it. All right. Well, I think we got a Schrader core removal if you want to do that. Put that somewhere to stay. I'll hang on to that. How's that? And I'll take uh, the, the screwdriver. I know we got to pull this, this leave off of there. Yep. All right. 
And you always want to take that rubber plug out as well. So take out the plug. Take out the plug. All right, so you know this is just the coil, and we're just trying to help the audience understand what it's going to look like. So I know you pre-cleaned a couple nice pieces of copper for us. We're going to use right. those to kind of we, simulate. Correct. We pre-cleaned those before, so we can uh, go ahead and get to it and show you how it's done. You know, anything you want the audience to know about best practices for brazing technique? Um, always red first, and then you follow with your oxygen to kind of set it in to where you want it. Okay, so acetylene first, then bring in the oxygen. Then bring oxygen. What about your flame tip? What, are you looking for color? Are you looking for length? What's your best uh, tips there? Um, I'm, I'm kind of looking for like color, go by sound a little bit just to make sure it's dialed in right. So well, let's see it. So we got a nice blue flame, nice blue the length flame. you're comfortable with. You said kind of that little sizzle that sounds little good sizzle for you. That little sizzle sound. Yeah, right. that way we know we're not burning too hot. Well, show us how it's done. Don't those pliers there. Kind of start by heating up this here. So we can get that solder nice and loose there. All right. So yeah, so I see it's pre-flared, so you don't have to cut it. We can just run our liquid line directly into it. Correct. So, Jerome, any best practices as far as when you uh, get the copper hot enough? Anything you're looking for is when to put the uh, material on it? Uh, you want to make sure you keep that heat moving because that solder is going to follow that heat, basically. So, get a little bit on there and a little bit to kind of get you a long way. You want to kind of keep it back here at this point where you got the swedge at so you can pull it into it. And then kind of get it to flow around the actual coil itself. Really don't need much. All right, Dan, it is as easy as that. All right, so are we good to let those air cool? Do you think it's best to put uh, the rag back on them? Uh, you could put a cold rag on them, cool them down a little faster. You know, we had the brazing shield. It looks like if you're doing it properly, you know, that's more precautionary than anything else. We certainly want to protect that coil of all, above all else, but, right. you know, proper brazing rod, best practices should protect it anyway. Correct. Just like frying bacon, right? Like frying bacon. And that way you can check your uh, brace points too when you cool it down, make sure you don't have any pinholes or anything like that within the solder. And then what just you standard practice, really you probably pull the vacuum on it, right, to make pull sure the vacuum, you right. everything. More importantly now, with R454B, you don't want any leaks. Yeah, very much so. We're going through a lot of, uh, a lot of effort to make sure that that refrigerant's staying where we want it to. Yes, sir. You All are. right. So if you were to have a leak at this point, you pull the vacuum and it doesn't hold, What's the best practice there? Just cut the old one off, just unbraze it. What's oh, we got looking in the hole, then you would uh, fill it with nitrogen, mm -hmm. and then find a point that's where it's you know get your uh, bubbles and so find a soapy where water test probably the soapy best water way to test do. be the best way to do it. Okay, and that'd be true for the indoor or the outdoors. Uh, both. Yep. Correct. All right. So now that we have it brazed in, just standard business practice. Of course, now this would chase to the outside if this were a real install. Sure. We're here in our R and D lab, so we're just simulating. But now that we know we have a good refrigerant connection there, we've pulled the vacuum, it's held, so we know we're in good shape. Now I guess the biggest question is, what are we doing with this sensor here, right? Right. So as I said earlier, this uh, big shielded cable, this is actually gonna come just like this, terminated outside with a strain relief, right? Correct. And then uh, this coiled up inside, now we cut some of the zip ties just to make it a little bit easier. But uh, how is the best practice for whenever you go in to wire this in? What's, uh, what's the technician to do, first thing? Well, you want to pull that out the top of the coil and um, 
It's, this will come with an extra strain relief inside the packaging. In the parts bag? In the parts bag. And that, I guess, probably for when you terminate into the cabinet. When you terminate right? into the cabinet, so you have somewhere to connect. You can run it to either side, whichever more convenient. I mean, there's enough cable to run it to either side. Of the yeah, you know, that's the thing that stands out to me. We see a lot of cable here. Why not make it shorter? Well, just in case you have to, like I said, run down the cabinet or if you need to install the sensor uh, downstream from the unit, uh, depending on the application that you have. Oh, uh, maybe on like a horizontal application. Horizontal application or something like that. You might that. have to put it move, in the air ducts. You might have to put in, move the sensor, correct. Gotcha, and this would give us enough length. So you're always, it's correct. better to have too much and too little. Uh, last thing we want to do is have anybody need more, more wiring. So we err on the side right. of caution, give you a nice long cable. Should be able right. to terminate easier. Correct. And I know Aaron's explained it, but I think it goes, uh, it's it's worthwhile maybe explaining the different connections. Let's see, we got six yeah, uh, we got different leads there. Can you Six maybe different wires here. Explain All what right. those to go to. So you have your red wire. This is going to go to your red going to the outdoor unit. Your white wire is going to go to the red at the board. That's going to be your power wire. Your green wire, in case you have a zone system, it'll um, go into a purple wire, um, which I'll demonstrate here in a minute. Um, in case you need to open up the dampers to help mitigate the refrigerant. So if you did see a leak, the last thing you want to do is throw all of that refrigerant into one smaller space. Correct. Open all the dampers and it gets dispersed. Let it disperse. Below the LFL. Makes Correct. Sense. Uh, this is your common wire. This is going to be your blue wire, which is going to go to your yellow wire, which goes to your outdoor unit. And then this wire here is going to go to your YY2. Okay. So black's a common, blue goes outdoor, orange is the Y2. Correct. All right. So let's go ahead and shoot those in. Let's pull the doors off the unit here. Thank you for that. I'll grab the strike and the brazing rod for you. Now I've loosened the doors. Normally they'd be a little bit tighter than that, but make that easy. Okay. So for anybody that's never done an install, you might say, what is going on in there? But uh, for a pro like you and some of our audience, you know, obviously some of these connections are going to send different things. Why don't you walk us through which one goes where? All right. So we want to kind of twist those together a little bit to kind of help, you know, just get it through there and get our wires in. Let's slide by you there. All right. Now, normally your furnace wouldn't be on wheels, right? No, no that'd be a problem. <laughs> I mean, it's not permanent, so. Okay, so that should be enough there for the heat. And I did lift the screwdriver. Okay. All right, so you got chased in there, and uh, now we're gonna make our terminations for our setup. Correct. I know we kind of have one that sits in between the thermostat and the unit, right? And it kind of can shut down your heat engine, shut down your cooling engine, and kick on your fan at the cooling speed. Correct. Okay, so is that wire directly onto the board then, or do we do some kind of intermediary connection? Um, as far as your purple, that's going to be your green. Like I said, that's going to help you to, in case you have a zone system, kick on that blower. So you just kind of want to wire nut that right into your purple. Get you a nice secure twist on there and get that in. And then you have your red, which is going to be to your 24 volt outdoor, which is going to go to the red that goes to that outdoor unit there. It's a red outdoor, red indoor? Red outdoor. Nice. Get you a good connection there. And then you have your yellow, which is going to be your blue for your outdoor. You'll go with So blue off the sensor goes to your yellow. Goes to your yellow, it goes to the outdoor, correct. We can't combine those and make one green wire? Just kidding. No primary colors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll get that in there. Start with those first. And then the rest of these connections will be made at the board. Okay, so when I said uh, outside the board or... or on the board, it's actually a little bit of both. A little bit of both, correct. So like I say here, you got this orange wire, which will be going to your YY2. Let me get that loosened up for you. Get in there a little bit. And... and I know on our furnace, since the board's face out mounted, it makes it real easy to get in there, right? It does, it puts it right up top for you. You don't have to lay down and go in that blower cabinet. <laughs> Always thinking of our technicians first. That's right. All right, and then you have your black wire, which is going to be your common wire, which is going to go to C. 
And then you'll have your white wire, which is going to be your 24 volts that's going to go to red. It's going to go right here to R. Make sure you get it in there and get a nice connection. Get it pretty snug on there so we don't so have it slip out on you. So, and that's that. That's pretty much it. Well, I tell you, you know, this thing could be pretty, uh, pretty scary, but looking at it, it's not too crazy. You know, the braze connection seemed like it went really well, and it helps when you have an expert brazer like yourself. Uh, with us already having our RDS installed, really the only thing you have to worry about is a nice easy chase into the cabinet using the strain relief, right. and then and making, making uh, a few connections there that, uh, you know, standard business practices for anybody doing installs. Well, nice work, Jerome. You know, I know a lot of our uh, installers and, and servicers uh, you know, it's kind of easy to get intimidated by this, but you know, as you showed, uh, pretty straightforward, just like you're used to on a regular install. There are a few more connections to be made, but uh, ultimately it looks like brazing as normal, right? Correct. Yeah. Wiring, just like we do on anything else, a few external connections, but nothing right. too crazy, right? And a little bit of brazing shield that, you know, is really just best practice on that. But, uh, you know, it's nice to see some of this stuff isn't nearly as scary as, as it's made out right. to be. Correct. Great. Yeah. Well, nice work, Jerome. You know, I know there's been a lot of talk about the A2L and how scary it's been, but uh, I think you did a great job showing our audience that really this is more or less an install like they're used to. Correct. Right. Nothing changed, just um, the refrigerant bulb and that everything is about the same. Yeah, Nothing, you're still no brazing way. just like normal. Right. Right. You're still making wiring connections. Still making connections. You just terminating the side of the cabinet and then you just have this extra added harness for the RDS yeah. refrigerant detection sensor. So. Well, great.